Dear God, we are abundantly grateful for who you are and for your call uh, in our lives. I pray that you'll help me to uh, get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life in the lives of those who are gathered here today. And, um, and God, help each person hear what you need them to hear, regardless of what I speak. We love you. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, just a, a brief update. Um, I wish I had uh, lots more update, but there have been complications and holdups in the building process um, in both places, uh, the New Hope Life Center and in the social hall area. Um, over at New, New Hope Life Center, we're lining up, the, the contractors are being lined up by, uh, uh, by our folks, and um, um, they should be starting ASAP anytime now. Yay! Keep that in your prayers. Uh, talking about when the, the one of the phrases that we're talking about today is do not be anxious for anything. I confess to you, I've been a little bit anxious about this getting started. And so I'm just supposed to pray about it. Um, for the social hall, the commencement statement has now been signed, signed, and that's the last stage of the permitting process. There's been a little bit of work done. You can't see it because it's all behind the sanctuary. There's been a um, a concrete pad laid for the air conditioning units that will be there, and uh, a little bit of site work back there that doesn't really relate to the building itself. But uh, done some work on some sidewalks. You may have seen that working on. But just um, we hope to see a lot of very active work very soon. Am I right? I'm looking. I'm looking at the head of our trustees, Paul Lancaster. We're really, we're really hoping. We're really praying for that. Right. All right. Um, so that's a big thing. So today, the next two weeks, we're going to be really looking at, at Philippians chapter 4. Um, it's a great place to reflect and stop on Thanksgiving. Um, so it's a feature of both, um, of both Sundays. And um, one of the things uh, that's important here is to remember, Paul was in chains awaiting trial in front of an insane tyrant by the name of Nero um, as he gave these important words to the Philippian church. Um, so this is his context. He's talking about joy and gratitude and the peace of Christ and about getting along and, and all these different things and being kind to one another. And, and a lot of times, we preachers, we start at verse 4 um, in this text. Um, but I think that it's important that we read the first three verses too because Paul is responding um, to the first three verses in the next six verses. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, all right, I don't usually stop after one word, but wherever you see therefore, it's important to know what it's there for, okay? Um, uh, that means what happened all in front of this so that it makes sense, right? So he's talking about the first three chapters in Philippians 1, 20 and 21. Paul says, for I fully expect and hope I will never be ashamed, but that I will be, that I will be continuously to be, I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. All right, always remember that verse. Huge. So Paul's part of saying, the therefore Part of that is this, this word right here that says, living is Christ, dying is even better, okay? Um, then he talks in the, in the end of that chapter, he talks about how it's important for us, even as we are citizens of this earth, maybe even Roman citizens, he was saying to them, you are primarily, first and foremost, citizens of heaven. And you know what, folks? It is good to remember that we are primarily citizens of heaven after an election week, okay? Okay. Um, can I hear an amen? amen? Amen. Remember that always. Then in chapter 2, he talks about how important it is for, uh, for us to, to develop and learn how to have the mind of Christ. And in chapter uh, 2, verse 2, he says, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Love one another and work together with one mind and one purpose. In verse 14 of chapter 2, Paul says, Do everything without complaining and arguing. And I give thanks that everyone in this room has nailed that beautifully. In chapter 3, it says, he talks about the priceless value of knowing Christ is Lord and that everything else is worthless when compared to having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he says, I'm pressing on to the goal. And he encourages us to press on towards the goal of the fullness of Christ. So that's the therefore. 
Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and crown I received from my work. Um, one of the things about being in ministry is the longer you're in it, the more joys and crowns you get to have, okay? Um, and it's really wonderful. Um, I, I, look, I thought back to, to some of the joys and crowns in previous congregations that I've served in. And I remember Danny and Lisa, they were a couple who, um, in the late 80s, they were shocked when their baby was diagnosed um, with AIDS. And um, they realized at that point that, that Danny had been a, an IV drug user in recovery for two years and that he didn't even know that he had the HIV virus. And so I got to come alongside that, that young family in the midst of the most difficult kind of period in their life, baptize their baby and, um, and be with them um, when she died. Uh, I remember and give thanks for, for Leanne, a crown um, and a joy. Um, just a, a wonderful human being who blessed us in immeasurable ways. And, and the first Sunday that, that we were appointed to be here, um, the next day, um, the next day, um, her, her son got hit by a car. And um, so we went up to Gainesville to be with her. Um, and we were there when she made the decision to take him off life support. Um, she's a great uh, a joy and crown. I think of the couple, um, Jack and Norma Jean, um, they, were, they were awesome. They were kind of like surrogate parents to Denise and I. They just sort of took us under their wing. The first uh, Thanksgiving that we were there, Denise and I, um, we lived in a very remote place, and we went all the way over to Palatka for fun. <laughs> and, and we had Thanksgiving dinner at the, at the Golden Corral. And, um, and, so, and so this couple got wind of that, and they, she looked at me and said, you will never do that again. You are having Thanksgiving dinner at our house when this happens now. Okay? So they took us in. Um, there's um, Wayne was a guy who, uh, he, he, he was there the first week at a new church, and he said, my life's falling apart. I need to get it together. Um, is there anything that I can do around here that would help? I said, oh, my, Yes. And I got the privilege of watching Wayne grow and, and become closer to God and do all kinds of incredible work um, around the church. And, and of course, I mean, here I've got all kinds of joys and crowns in each of you. One of them um, is, is Vicki Harrison, who I've got the privilege of getting to watch her um, go into the ministry. And, and it's like I watch her grow um, in her faith and in the way that she uses God's gifts in her lives. And um, I mean, I... I hope you realize what an incredible message she did last week on glorifying grace. Um, it, um, it was very powerful, and it, I know that it touched a lot of you, and um, I know that you were moved by that. We all have that, but, and guess what? When you do ministry as a layperson, there are joys and crowns in your spheres of influence as well. You get to see um, how important people are and the blessings that they are. It's true for everyone in that time. But, but uh, you know, I look out in the sanctuary and I see lots of joys and crowns. And Paul was right. Ministry has these incredible joys and crowns waiting for us. Um, but the other reality is there's pains and thorns too. Um, it was true for Paul. Um, it was true for Jesus, certainly. Um, and it's going to be true for everyone who ever engages in any form of ministry whatsoever. That goes for lay people and clergy alike. And Paul, again, addressed this, the pain and the thorn, in the very next verse, verse 2. Now, I appeal to you, Odia and Suntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these women, these two women, for they work hard, they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. So Paul addresses this, this disagreement. Now remember, he's writing from jail. He's far away. Um, and he says that, in other words, this disagreement had so infected the church that he knows about it and he's writing about it and he's saying, you got to stop this. You got to put this down. You got to let it go. And and see, by refusing to set aside this disagreement, the message and the witness of the good news, the life-saving power of Jesus Christ was, 
was being put on the shelf, was being disregarded. And that was a problem. And the word, the word co-worker that's used here is the word sunathlene. It mean, literally means with athlete. That means they were with they were working so hard. They were on the same team. They were pulling together. They were running the race side by side. They were on Team Jesus. They were getting it done. And Paul honors and appeals to Euodia and Syntyche by reminding them of the ways that God had already used them and had done so together. Now, we have no clue what the specific conflict was all about. But we know that it couldn't have been about something that was essential to the Christian faith or else Paul would have named it and called it out. Paul was never hesitant about, uh, about addressing an issue of doctrine. In 1 Corinthians 15, um, Paul says, says something really important about the resurrection. There were some people who were believing that Jesus was not physically raised from the dead, and he addressed that in the entire chapter, and he called them out on it. And Galatians, he says, no, you guys are wrong. You don't have to get circumcised before you follow Jesus. You don't have to have Jesus and anything else. It's Jesus alone through whom we are saved. And he called them out on that. So he doesn't even bother to do that here, does he? He just says, says whatever the issue is, it may, be, it may be significant, but it is not related to the core of who we are as followers in Jesus Christ. And Paul shows no interest whatsoever in the cause of, of the problem and the disagreement. He's not concerned with who's right and who's wrong. Um, uh, whatever it was, it was so inconsequential that it was not supposed to get in the way of making more and better followers of Jesus Christ. That was the problem. And Paul encouraged others to help them to do everything they could in their power to help them let go of the argument and to remember all that they've done for God's glory together in the past. And here's the thing, as many, as many joys and crowns as there also become in 32 years of ministry, there are, also plenty of, there are also plenty of pains and thorns along the way. And I could tell you a lot of those stories, too. I'm just going to tell you one. Uh, one happened a number of years ago. There was an ongoing conflict between two women in the life of the church. And, and we tried every single way that we knew how to help them get along with one another. We you know, many different ways, many different people tried to intervene and help uh, through the years. And then one day, um, one of the women, uh, the woman who I, I really thought was the least at fault in this, the other one seemed to be really just holding on too tight to the, the conflict. Um, and she brought me in a letter. And in the letter, the other woman um, had given a death threat towards her. In case you're wondering, death threats towards other church members are unacceptable, okay? <laughs> and um, and so, so I met with the woman who'd given the, the written death threat, and, and I, not knowing what else to do, I said, obviously, this isn't going to be resolved, and I think it's time for you to find a new church. It's time for you to figure something else out, because this isn't going to work. Um, now, whenever a young person... Uh, is considering ministry, and the key reason that they give is they say, well, I just really like people. I say, run away. <laughs> that, that, can't be, that can't be the key reason why you feel God's calling you um, into ministry, uh, because you're, you're going to be profoundly disappointed. And that's not only clue for, true for clergy people, that's cr true for all lay people, because all of us are called into ministry. And and it's just got to be the way it is. The pains and the thorns are always going to be there too. And just as Paul said, for the sake of the good news, something had to change in the relationship of Yodi and Sontaiki, something had to change in the relationship of these two women. And that's why they had to simply separate. Um, that was my breaking point. Now, um, I am glad that whatever Euodia and Syntyche were dealing with was not as difficult as what those two women in the previous church were dealing with. Um, but we do know um, that, that they, they were told, you got to figure this out. You got to get along. We don't know what happened to Euodia and Syntyche. They don't show up anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, did they follow Paul's uh, counsel? Uh, I wish we knew. It would be helpful. 
But what if, what if they refused? What if they said, we're not going to let go of this disagreement. We're going to hold on to it. We're going to cling to it. And we're going to nurse this resentment towards one another. Well, we get a hint about that um, when, when we see what Paul does in Acts chapter 15. Um, he, uh, he was traveling with his brother in Christ, whom he loved dearly, Barnabas, known as the son of encouragement. And, and in Acts chapter 15, uh, we watch them uh, stand with one another. They were soon athlete, side by side, on the same team, declaring that, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and that, that the reality is nothing else but Jesus Christ alone is through whom we have grace. Put our faith in him and we receive grace. That's, that's what we need. So they, they did battle with that. They, they won the day. The early church made a decision that, yes, that was, in fact, exactly what we needed to do. Not circumcision, not anything else before. You simply come to Jesus. That is it. Um, they were completely together on this most important issue that there could be. But by the end of chapter 15 in the book of Acts, we see that they separated from one another for the sake of the good news over a secondary issue that they couldn't agree on. Um, and that was uh, John Mark had, uh, was the cousin of Barnabas, and they had traveled together on some of their missionary journeys with Paul, and, and he abandoned them at one point. And so, so now Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance, and Paul said, not yet, not now. He needs to do something else first. So they were in, they were in great disagreement about that. And in Acts 15, 39, it says, their disagreement was so sharp they separated. Now, they separated, and what did they both do? They went off and spread the gospel. Barnabas went his way, Paul went his way, and, and they tried to make more and better followers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Um, they just couldn't agree on this thing. And they separated for the sake of the good news in love with one another. Um, some of you may know that the United Methodist Church is facing a really important decision in February. Um, every other mainline denomination, that's like the Episcopal Church, the Lutheran Church, Presbyterian, United Church of Christ, they've all experienced either a, a church split um, or, or massive numbers of people um, leaving out the door um, because of, of uh, the changing standards uh, an understanding of human sexuality to include uh, that marriage is between two people instead of between a man and a woman. And so the United Methodist Church is, is we're coming to a crossroads as a denomination, not a local church, as a denomination where um, 864 delegates will make a decision about whether or not um, pastors can perform same gender weddings and whether or not they can be performed um, in our churches. Now, um, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Absolutely, I don't know. I have no clue how this is going to work itself out. There are three very different plans in place. One of them is called the, the Connectional Conference Plan, and it is highly unlikely to get enough traction uh, for anything because it requires two-thirds vote at general conference and two-thirds of all the annual conference delegates around the world. That's just a really high bar. So the two plans that are mainly being talked about are the traditional plan, which says we will continue to maintain our current standards on human sexuality. It says marriage is between one man and one woman, and we do not um, ordain GBLTQ clergy to serve as pastors in our churches, and, um, and our pastors won't do those weddings. And the other plan is called the One Church Plan, which says that, that basically um, every local church can decide for itself what it's going to do. Every local church pastor can decide what he or she is going to do. And every annual conference will decide um, what to do about LGBTQ um, ordination. Now, um, the general conference is the only body that speaks officially for the United Methodist Church. So those 864 delegates are going to make a decision. Um, and and we, just, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, what I would tell you is that um, I'm a traditionalist. Um, I believe it's really important for us to be uh, rooted in God's word, <clears throat> that we speak the truth in grace, that we love all people in the midst of that. So I'm a traditionalist, but I'm not angry about it. 
Um, and, and I think it's important that we, we focus in on the ways that we can be the church right here, right now. So I don't know what the future holds, but I know the one who holds the future. Now, it's way too uncomplicated to unpack the, all these plans in, in, you know, in a sermon. <clears throat> but I do want to let you know that in the new year, we're going to do a sermon series that kind of looks at these. We're going to also take a look. Uh, we're going to, your pastors will come and be with you in your connect groups so we can have individual conversations about this um, because it's a lot easier to have a conversation um, rather than a lecture. Um, and so that's what we're planning to do at the beginning of the year. And also, if you, if you want some more information, uh, there's a, there's a one-page handout on the welcome desk um, as you're leaving this morning. You can just pick that up, and, and it'll give, give you a little bit more uh, definition of, of what the plans look like. But for many people in the United Methodist Church, <clears throat> this question of human sexuality is not a core issue. For many people, it is a core issue. And those general conference delegates are going to decide, <clears throat> as a denomination, uh, what, what it's going to be for us. Um, and um, we may need to separate for the sake of the good news, like Barnabas and Paul did. I hope not. I hope that's not the case. Um, many of you know one of my favorite phrases is, um, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, <clears throat> and in all things, love. And um, so as we focus on this, we see some, we're not agreeing on what, what are the essentials. Um, and that's one of the key problems here in this ongoing discussion. But e eventually, um, each annual conference and each local church may well need to make some decisions about what they're going to do. So, and that's going to be three months from now when they have, the conference is in late February um, in St. Louis. Um, so, so just the thing to do right now is lift that up in prayer because we still believe in a God who's powerful, who has signs and wonders, who can figure this out in ways that we can't yet imagine, um, and that's important. Now, then, then what happens in this text is Paul seems to move in a, in a completely new direction, but everything he, he says in the following verses are in response to what he's just said to Euodia and Suntyche and to those trying to help them on the journey. Uh, because, because the problem is, Yodi and Sutaiki weren't following the prescription that Paul gives here in the next six verses on how to live life. Instead, they were clinging to their conflict and nursing their grudge. Verse 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Joy, some form of that word shows up 16 times in Philippians. It's, the, it's a book of joy. It's filled with it. And, and the key to the, this phrase joy here is, is in the Lord. It's not joy in yourself. It's not joy in anyone else. It's not joy in an activity. It's joy in the Lord. Um, all of our blessings are in Christ. And since we are in Christ, um, we always have a reason to be joyful. And Paul says, this is a choice. He says, I want you to make a plan to be full of joy. And you know what Paul knew? Paul knew that it was impossible to be full of joy when you're nursing a grudge. Grudges simply need to be released. Verse 5, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. So that, that's like he's given that perspective. Hey, Jesus is coming back any moment now. He said that 2,000 years ago. You know what? It's still true. Jesus is still coming back any moment now. So the Lord is, 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 is maybe seeming slow to us, but uh, not in his time. And, um, and he's saying, hey, remember to keep an eternal perspective about all of your earthly temporal problems. And being considerate here, considerate often is a, used as a gentle word that can mean something soft and passive. But the fact is, he's saying, you know, it's easy to power up and demand our own way. And being considerate requires us to be assertive, not aggressive. And I think he captures this in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, when he combines some things, he says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. Verse 6, don't worry about anything. Everybody doing good with that? 
Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So Paul wants us to be grateful for all of the blessings in our lives and through all of the trials and tribulations that we face. He wants us to understand that that thankfulness is a good attitude to bring to the table, always. Um, And a lot of times we think it's easier to be thankful through the good times. But guess what? It's not. Um, why? Because it's easier to take, it grant, take for granted sometimes. Um, just as, as a, it's a challenge to be grateful when we have far more uh, than, than, we, than enough, um, God wants us to understand that gratitude is the antidote for our worry. So it's like, and, and it's like, and when we lift up our prayers to God, we're saying, God, here's what I'm worried about. I mean, I'm not living this out very well. I worry about stuff all the time. I have to remember, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm supposed to turn that worry into a prayer, bring it to the throne of grace and give it to God. And that's what we're all called to do. And it's so hard sometimes because sometimes we just, we just drift back to worry. Oh, I, I'll give you this, God. Oh, no, I'm going to snatch it back, right? Let God have the worry. But see, gratitude helps us look beyond our hurts and our disappointments and our grudges. Verse 7, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a promise, but it's a conditional promise, isn't it? It says, if you do all this, then you will get to experience the peace of Christ. And always remember, it's Jesus' peace. It's his to give. So you have to come to him to get it. You're not going to get it any other way than coming to him to receive this peace. And it will guard your hearts and minds. Euodia and Syntyche, they were missing out on this peace from Jesus because they were clinging to their conflict. The reality is, worry always hurts. Prayer always inspires. The reality is, uh, worry drains us and tears us apart. Prayer fills us and brings us together. Worry is natural. Prayer is a supernatural gift from God. And choosing joy puts together what is natural, uh, the world as it is, in all of its good, bad, and ugly, and, and with the supernatural, the world as God intends it to be through us as we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we recognize that worry isolates us from God and one another. Prayer connects us to God and one another. And choosing to be joyful builds on the connection of the God who loves us so much and who wants to connect us with one another. Worry shrinks our vision and hampers our ability uh, to step, to, to, for our, it, worry shrinks our vision and hampers our ability to see God's preferred future for our life together. Um, worry focuses on what we don't have and what we can't do. Um, worry focuses on limited circumstances and limited resources. Prayer opens us up to the unlimited resource and the unlimited creativity of the living God who promises more abundantly than we can think, imagine, or ask. And choosing joy helps us have an idea of how to stay in the solution once we see God's way forward. Worry is always unattractive. Worry is repelling. Prayer is beautiful, and it draws people in. And prayer includes and embraces. That's why Paul says, release your worries, turn to God in prayer. Verse 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What if we intentionally chose to fix our thoughts on these qualities? Uh, Truth, honor, that which is right, pure, lovely, and admirable so well that uh, they were qualities that people first thought of when they heard the word Christian. Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, Every day, it's easy for us to focus on what is false and dishonorable and unjust and impure and shameful. That's why it's so important for That's easy. 
God says, I need you to fix your thoughts on that which is, is good and helpful. And Paul invites us to choose hope and new life in Christ. Paul invites us to train our minds to think in a positive way as a daily discipline of, wait for it, sanctifying grace, of, the, of being what it means to be perfected in love. How important that is. That's good. Last verse, verse 9. Keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me do. Then the God of peace will be with you. And so the God of peace stands guard over your soul. And because the God of peace is on duty, we can relax and release to him every worry. God, thank you for this word, from your word. Um, it's hard to live into, but we're going to trust you on the journey. We're going to trust that you're with us. We pray that you'll help us to choose joy. We pray that you'll help us to choose gratitude. We pray that you'll help us to desire the peace that you want to pour into us. We are your grateful people. Help it be so, Lord, in Jesus' name. We all agreed and said, amen.